Chapter 11 D. When I start to feel the tugs of awareness, the first thing I notice is a shrill sound, the annoying beeping that won't shut the hell up. I try to move my arms to find the offending noise, but they don't move. When I attempt to open my eyes, nothing happens. I go through the checklist, trying to make something, anything, respond to my mental command. Nothing. I lay there trying to come up with a reason why I can't feel anything, can't move anything, and can't see anything. Nothing. I can hear the beeping start to pick up as my mind continues to panic. With every rapid burst, my mind and body start to freak out even more. I want to scream, but nothing happens. Right when I think my panic might be too much for me to control, I feel something cold hit my arms, and in seconds my heart calms, and my mind goes blissfully blank. The blackness returns, and I fly off to dream again. This time Bex here, smirking with his beautiful full lips and his brown eyes darkened with desire. My smile comes easily when I realize he's here. He's always here when I need him. I don't waste a second before I rush into his arms and soak in his strength. My last thought before I let my dream carry me away is that I am so happy that his arms are holding me tight again. I've denied us this for so long, and even though he understands why, he still doesn't deserve it. When his lips touch mine, I want to cry out against the unfairness, but the blackness clouds my vision again, and I fly away. That damn beep is back. What the hell is that noise? After attempting and failing to move my body, I take a deep breath and try to figure out what's going on and why I'm unable to move. I can hear a voice somewhere in the room, so I direct all my attention on that and try my hardest to pick up on something that might be useful. With every fiber of my being, I strain and concentrate, but only manage to pick up a word here and there. Asleep still. Days. Haven't caught. Should call her family. Optimistic. Should come. I try to focus some more, but it's taken so much of my energy just to understand those twelve stupid words. I want to weep when the fear seeps into my bones. I have no clue what's happening or where I am. The last thing I remember is going into the office and getting that stupid email from my mother. I try to keep my mind alert long enough to figure out what the hell is going on. But after only a few moments, I'm flying away again towards the darkness. God, every single part of my body hurts. My head is pounding like I've just come off a week-long bender. My throat and lungs burn with every breath I take. My arms and legs feel as if I've just worked out of that torturous spin class Izzy likes to drag me to. And oddly enough, even my hair hurts. What the hell? After accessing my body and realizing that, yes, every inch does in fact hurt, I fixate on the sounds around me. I can hear voices again, but this time I know who they are, or at least I think I do. I definitely recognize Maddox's low growl. It takes me a second to place Coop's voice, though. He doesn't sound like his normal playful self. Chelsea's voice is the next one I catch, talking in a rushed low tone. I think she sounds scared but I can't understand her words clearly enough to be certain. Just when I think that I know all the players in the room, one more voice speaks up, and my heart stops in my chest for a minute before it picks up speed. I don't even need to have my eyes open to know he's sitting right next to me. Now that I'm becoming more aware of my surroundings, I can feel him, not just the warmth on my arm and hand, but I can feel his energy in the room, the ever-present love and strength is pouring all over me like a warm blanket. But I also feel his darkness, that vibe of menacing violence that is just itching to come out. He's pissed and trying to contain it. I try to remember what happened that could cause this type of reaction from him, but my mind keeps coming up with a big fat nothing. It's there, the answers that I need, but they are just out of reach. She'll wake up when she's ready, so I'd appreciate it if you would stop talking about her like we need to start planning her goddamn funeral. Beck's snarl shocks me for a second until his words penetrate my brain. Why would they think I'm dying? I want to cry out and scream that I'm awake, I'm here, and everything is going to be okay. But when I open my mouth, 
Nothing comes out but a strangled choke. I feel the vibe in the room change instantly when they realize I'm waking up. The waves of sadness, anger, and confusion dissipate, and a burst of joy and relief zaps through my body. Shh, it's okay, baby. Let me call the nurse and have her come check you out. I don't know if I can give you any water, so let me go get her. I grab his hand with what little strength I have when he goes to move away from me. Tightening my weak fingers around his hand, I desperately hope he understands that I don't want him to leave my side. My eyes refuse to budge, so I slowly turn my head to where I think he is. Opening my mouth, I try to tell him not to leave me, but that sickening noise comes out again. Dee, please don't try and talk. I'm not leaving. I'm right here. Coop, go get the nurse. I feel him move closer from where he must have been standing, his free hand brushing against my hairline. I'm not leaving, he vows. The energy around me goes still, and he continues to murmur in my ear. I can't tell what he's saying because he's speaking too low, but it's still comforting. His soothing tones calm my out-of-control heart in seconds. Well, I see Sleeping Beauty decided to wake for her prince after all. My name is Destiny. We've been waiting for you. I'm going to move your bed up slightly so that I can move the straw into your mouth. Okay, honey? When the nurse's soft voice starts explaining to me why I hurt, I start to panic again. What the hell happened to me? All right, honey, open up and let's see if we can get you talking. Your throat's going to hurt, but let's see what we can do. That's it. Small and slow sips. When I get enough to make my throat feel less like I've decided to eat sandpaper and closer to a dull throb, I unlatch my lips from the straw. That's good. That's good. Can you tell me your name, honey? The the niece My voice causes me to jump slightly. A low moan of pain escapes, and I try to calm my breathing when the pain gets a little too intense. I'll get you something for that pain in just a second, okay? You're doing great. I hear as she moves around the room and then places a cuff on my arm. When it finishes its tight squeeze, she reads my blood pressure out loud. I try for a few seconds to calm myself down by taking shallow breaths. My right eye finally cracks open, and I take in the room around me. My nurse, a beautiful woman with skin as dark as night and hair back in a tight bun, is still moving around the edge of the bed. I can see Maddox, Coop, and Chelsea in the corner by the window. Maddox has both of his thick arms crossed tightly over his large chest. His face is hard, but I can tell by the slight tick in his jaw that he isn't holding his emotions in as well as he would like. No, he's pissed. To my shock, Coop has Chelsea wrapped tightly in his arms, slightly rubbing her back. When my eye finally hits the worried, dark gaze of the man sitting by my bed, I want to cry. His eyes are red and I can tell he's either been without sleep or he's been crying, and I desperately hope he just hasn't slept. His brows are drawn in tight, his lips are pressed into a line, and his thick brown hair is mussed and standing in a million directions. Even looking as terrible as he does right now, he still is the most beautiful man I've ever seen. Everything looks great, honey. I'm going to get you some more medication for your pain. It's going to make you sleepy so let me get the doctor to explain what's going on before you turn into Sleeping Beauty again. My eyes never leave Beck's face. That's right. This prince of yours hasn't left your side once, so I imagine I wouldn't want to stop looking at him either. She lets out a soft giggle before I hear her slip from the room. I try to offer him a small reassuring smile, but it must fall flat because his eyes look even more pained. He leans in and kisses my forehead softly right before I hear footsteps next to my bed again. I turn my head from Beck's worried face and focus on the new arrival. She's wearing a white coat, so I'm only assuming this is my doctor. She puts me instantly at ease with her calm smile, but it's her eyes that make me feel like I'm in good hands. She has the kindest eyes. Hello there, I'm Dr. Knott. I understand you just woke up. About thirty minutes ago, ma'am. Beck speaks, and I'm thankful that I don't have to try out my voice again. Good. Good. I understand there was an incident at your office, and I know that the police have been waiting for you to wake to speak to you, but I think I can hold them off for a few days. You need your rest. We're going to keep you on the pain meds for at least another day or so and let your body get a little better before we take the good stuff from you. She smiles again, 
and pats the arm opposite of the one that Beck is rubbing softly. You have a few bruised ribs, but luckily nothing broken there. Your eye, the left one, is going to look and feel a lot worse than it is. But in a few days, the swelling should go down enough for you to be able to open it. We do want to make sure that you aren't having issues with your vision, so we will need to check it. There are a few other bruises and bumps, but right now, we're keeping an eye on your head to make sure the swelling stays down. You're a lucky girl. By the looks of it, it could have been a lot worse. She continues to explain various things about healing and home care, but I'm too busy taking in everything she just told me. Beck asks a few questions, but I don't hear them. I just lay there in shock. She asks me a few more things that I weakly answer before she leaves the room with the promise of sending Destiny back in with my pain medication. The second door closes. It's as if the floodgates slam open and all the memories, leading up to now, come rushing back. The office. No alarm. Light on. The man. Oh, God. The man. Shh. Dee. Look at me. It's okay. I've got you. I turn and focus on him trying to calm the rapid breathing that has my ribs screaming. Did you find him? He shakes his head, and when I hear a snarl from the side of the room, my eye shifts to Maddox, who looks as if he's about to snap in half. Beck yells at him to either calm down or leave the room before making me look at him again. It's okay. I need you to believe me, Dee. We're working on it, okay? I see his eyes pleading with me, begging me not to close him out. I take a few shallow breaths and focus on his eyes. Okay, I trust you, Beck. His shoulders sag with my whispered words and his eyes drop for a second before he looks back at me. I gasp when I see the moisture forming in his eyes. Thank you, God, thank you. He leans up, kisses me lightly before sitting back down and starts to rub my arm again. I can tell from the way his lips are pressed tight and the slight flare of his nostrils that he's trying to compose himself. Destiny comes back in the room and she gives me the pain meds and checks the machines one more time before leaving. I try to stay awake, afraid that if I fall asleep I might not wake up again, clearly understanding me better than I understand myself. Beck recognizes my reluctance to close my one good eye. He brings his face back to my ear and starts to whisper softly again. Between his deep voice speaking softly against my neck and the strength I pull from just his touch— my eye starts to close and my heart starts to calm. The last thing to filter through my mind as I listen to his voice is how lucky I am that he's even here. It doesn't even matter that I can't even understand the words. He's here. For everything that I've put him through, my depression and PTSD, and my stupid mind letting the past rule my present, he still hasn't given up. If this isn't proof of just how far he really will go to fight for me, then I don't know what is. I let his love wrap around me and drift off to a dreamless sleep with the knowledge that when I wake up he's still going to be here, and it's up to me to fix this now. Chapter 12 Beck When the doctor finally told me she would be released, I want to actually hug the lady. For the last week I've sat by her side, hoping and praying that I would finally get to take her home. First, they wanted to keep her because of the swelling to her brain from repeated blows. God, just hearing them say that over and over had my body ready for a fight. When her head wasn't the main worry, it seemed that her kidneys were. And finally, a few days ago, she stopped pissing blood. We would have been out of here before now, but they wanted to monitor her kidneys to make sure there wasn't anything else going on. I think we were all ready to get her out of this room and back to Georgia. Dee was starting to get frustrated with the constant poking by the staff and lack of good food. All I could do was smile, because even though she was here, she was fighting mad. The important part was that she's here at all. Being this far from home wasn't ideal either. Having to keep everyone back there up to date with her progress had become more annoying than anything else. Somewhere around day seven, I finally passed the phone to Maddox and told him to keep them fucking happy. To be honest, I didn't really give a shit about keeping anyone up to date. I only have eyes for D, and all my focus is on keeping her comfortable and making sure that she feels safe. I look over at her sleeping face and I physically hurt when I see how swollen it still is. 
When she finally opened her left eye two nights ago, just a crack, she announced that she could see. We all released the collective breath that we had been holding since the doctor had warned us there was a chance her vision could have been impaired from the injury. Her eye really was the least severe of her wounds. There wasn't much of her body that wasn't covered in nasty black and purple bruises, right down to a few of her fingers. I leaned back in the chair that I've pulled up next to her bed and let my mind think about the call that we got Monday morning that all but stopped my heart. When Maddox came bursting through my office door with enough force to literally rip it off the hinges, I knew something was wrong. All it took was one word, D, and I was out of my chair and following him out the door. Coop had already brought the truck around and we hit the road from there. He filled me in during the drive. Her assistant called his phone in a panic. She had come to work to find the whole office trashed. She would have missed D, but in her panic she tripped over some overturned boxes. When she fell, she had a direct line of sight into the break room. By the time she had gotten to D's side and called 911, she said she could barely find her pulse. That was the last update we got. I spent the rest of the car ride thinking that when I finally made it to her, she would already be gone. The unknown was bad enough, but when I couldn't stop thinking about what I would do if she were taken from me, the crushing agony was almost too much to bear. Now, here we are almost two weeks after her attack and still no answers. Those first five days when she wouldn't wake up were the worst. There was enough time for Maddox to fill us in on what he had been investigating for her. I was livid at first, but then I tried to put myself in her shoes and slightly understood why she would go to Maddox. When she finally woke up enough to tell us what happened during the attack, it still felt like we were playing with a deck that was missing half the cards. She didn't know who the man was, and even if she knew how to find the employee he wanted, she didn't even know how to get in contact with him. The police came and got her statements, documented her injuries, and left with the promise that they would be investigating things. There wasn't anything left behind to give us a single clue as to who did this. The last call Maddox had with Greg, he filled him in on everything we knew. Our best hope was finding this Adam character, and hopefully he would shed some light on this mess. I didn't ask Maddox how the call went, and wasn't sure I wanted to know. I logically knew that Greg couldn't help when he didn't know what was happening. But the other part of me, the one that wanted someone to blame, couldn't stop the what-ifs from hitting me hard. Knowing that he was probably just as upset as the rest of us was the only thing that kept me from lashing out. Beck, you really need to head back to the hotel for a few hours and get some sleep. You aren't doing her any favors by running yourself into the ground. Coop smiled sadly. I'll stay with her, but please, man, you look like shit. I'll walk out that door the second she's ready to go with me. Not a second before, so shut the fuck up about it. He opens his mouth to argue some more, but snaps it shut tightly when he sees how pissed I'm getting. He's lost his damn mind if he thinks I'm leaving her again. Leave him alone. Maddox hasn't said much since we've been here, but when he spits those words out, Coop wisely shakes his head a few times before walking out the door. Maddox is silent for a beat longer, then laughs with no humor. That douchebag. I got back to the hotel last night and walked in on him banging Dee's assistant. Shouldn't be shocked, but fuck, you would think he knows when he should keep that shit locked up. He shakes his head a few times, clearly still not believing just how bad Coop has gotten when it comes to sleeping around. Well, to be honest, I didn't even see that one coming. Chelsea is always a real quiet girl, but I know she loves Dee, so this whole situation is really messing her up. I should have been paying more attention to Coop's level of comforting. Did he say anything about it? I ask, not taking my eyes off Dee. Yeah, some bullshit about helping her to remember she's still alive. Said she kept freaking out and he didn't know what else to do. What a dumbass. That's... well, I'm not really shocked. It is Coop. What can I say? We all know he's an asshole when it comes to chicks. But I really hoped he could keep it in his pants until we got back home. Chelsea doesn't deserve the hit-it-and-quit-it approach that he takes, regardless of why she slept with him. Talked to Axel this morning. He's having one hell of a time keeping Izzy in Georgia. 
His condescending tone has my head snapping in his direction. And you sound so pissed about that because... I don't think anyone else has noticed how far apart she and D have become recently. But if anyone has noticed, it would be him. I swear this man sees everything. Right. Don't play me for a fool. I've seen D since that motherfucker got a hold of her and Izzy. I've seen her struggling, and you picking her back up. I saw her breaking in too, and it wasn't anyone but you gluing those pieces back together. Not once did her best friends even see one damned thing. Not Izzy, not Greg, not one of them. So, yeah, I'm a little pissed about it. His eyes stay on her battered face for a few more beats before meeting mine. Everyone else kept giving you two shit, thinking you were playing some stupid fucking game. But if they would have opened their eyes for one second longer, they would have seen her hiding in plain sight with you fighting all her demons for her. I don't keep eye contact with him. Hearing D's and my private struggle broken down into a few sentences brings it all home. Two long fucking years. Two long years of me worrying that she might never come back from the place inside herself when she had become lost. And right now, right when I felt like she's finally healing, this happens, and I honestly don't know what kind of lasting effect this is going to have on her. I can only hope that she's become strong enough to realize that she has all the power in the world to become whole again, and a man who's willing to fight tooth and nail to help her get there. How long have you known? I feel Dee's hand tighten on mine. Silently letting me know that she's listening, too. Since you carried her out of heavies? My eyes shoot to Dee's face, even with her eyes still closed as if she's sleeping peacefully. A lone tear sneaks out and slides down her face, telling me that she knows just how much Maddox has seen. You never said anything, not once. I don't understand why you would be pissed if you watched it right along with them. I keep my tone light, but inside, knowing that I am apparently as transparent to Maddox as it gets, and he still kept his mouth shut, is a little hard to stomach. Was in my place. And before you get pissed, I didn't just sit back and ignore it. I watched. And if I thought for one second that you didn't have it handled, I would have stepped in. Not going to lie. There was a time when you both were attempting to make each other jealous or pissed enough to stop trying that I almost said something. Wouldn't have done me a bit of good, though. She doesn't need me sticking my nose where it doesn't belong. It's always been you. Not everyone would have the patience to stick around when that end result is a big unknown. Dee's hand clenches in mine so tightly that it's starting to hurt, even though her face still remains relaxed. I don't even know where to begin to respond to all that. I can't be pissed, because he's right. I had it under control, but it would have been nice to know I wasn't fighting alone. Patience wasn't even a factor. When you love someone, you fight. You fight for them, and you fight with them. She needed me to fight for her then, and I'll continue to do that until she can fight for herself again. I feel him come up behind me and clasp my shoulder in his strong grip, offering me his strength. That right there is why I didn't need to say anything. He walks to the other side of the bed, dips his head down to her ear, and talks low enough that I can't hear him. Her eyes snap open, and she looks right at me. Maddox leans up, kisses her on the forehead, and walks out the door. What did he just say? I whisper, not breaking eye contact. He... he said it's time for me and you to start fighting the same war, and not different battles. I nod my head. He's right. It's always been Dee fighting me, fighting herself, and running from her fears. And I've been fighting the world for her while she does it. It's time. Time for her to let me in and let me help her heal. Easier said than done with D, but when I look into her eyes, it isn't the same force field barrier that she normally has in place that I see. No, I see right into her soul, and the love she keeps carefully hidden, for once, isn't masked. That right there is all the hope I need. Chapter 13 D. If you don't stop treating me like a damn child, I'm going to lose it. I mean it, Beck. I want to go home. I want to sleep in my own bed. He laughs, actually laughs in my face, before turning back to the stove and flipping the pancake he's working on. Oh, the infuriating man. 
and damn him for making pancakes worthy of me kissing his feet. It's been two weeks, two damn weeks, since I've been released from the hospital, and he hasn't left my side once. He's becoming Betty freaking Crocker and Susie Homemaker all rolled into one. Too good-looking for his own good, man. He cooks my meals, does my laundry, and I bet if I asked, he'd wipe my ass for me. Don't get me wrong. I'm thankful for the assistance, but I haven't left the house once since we've been back. The first week, I don't think I could have left if I'd wanted to. My ribs screamed in pain whenever I moved, and my face would have given small children nightmares. I still look like I fought a semi and lost, but at least the bruises aren't as ugly and vibrant as before, and the swelling has gone down enough that I look somewhat normal. Now I just want out. I want to go to my own house, sleep in my own bed, and put some space between us. Oh, who am I kidding? The main reason I want out is because he's making me feel things that scare the shit out of me, making me believe that whatever I've been avoiding this whole time is possible. He's making me want everything he's laying down at my feet. He's making me crave everything that I've been running from. And he's got me so turned on that all he would need to do is say, Come, and I'm pretty sure my body would detonate like a perfectly crafted bomb. Yeah, I have to get out of here. He sets the spatula down on the counter and turns to look me in the eyes. We've been over this before. It's not safe for you to go home until we can finish the investigation, find out who attacked you, and get to the bottom of all this crap you've been dealing with. In secret, I might add, at work. So no, you aren't going anywhere because right here with me is the safest place for you to be. He gives me his trademark smirk and turns back to his flipping. I'll be fine. My apartment is secure. I won't even leave. I can work from home just as well as I've been working from your house. No. No? That's it? I'm fuming. I know I'm acting like a brat, but I'm terrified. Those walls, that mask... All the protective measures that I've perfected over the years disappeared that last day in the hospital. I can't get his words out of my head. Yeah, Dee, that's pretty much it. I know what you're trying to do. You're running, or I should say, you're trying to run. Well, guess what, babe? You aren't going anywhere. I finally, fucking finally got back in, and I'll be damned if I let you push me away again. He dishes out the pancakes and brings a plate over to me turning back to grab some orange juice from the fridge and the syrup from the counter before joining me at the table. I stare at him with my jaw hanging open as he starts shoveling food in his mouth. I'm not running, I whisper. He puts his fork down, wipes his mouth and looks at me. His eyes are soft and caring. You're right. You aren't running. You're trying to build that fortress back up around you. You're trying to hide. I've watched you since we've been back. The old D... The one that's been hiding behind fake smiles and laughter, that's what I expected to deal with when we got home. I was so worried about you after Brandon's attack. There were times when I really thought you would be dead when I came to check on you. He pauses and looks away for a second. With every word he speaks, my heart starts to pound harder in my chest. You've come so far, baby, and you've gone through hell. But the difference is now you aren't hiding anymore. My wildcat is back, and I'll be goddamned if I let her go again. He gives me a guarded smile, picks up his fork and starts eating again, as if he hasn't just dropped this, this emotional bomb in my lap. I don't even know what to say. He's right, and damn it, I don't even think I want him to let me go anymore. I'm so confused, I confess. I know, that's why we figured this out together. I'm right here. All you have to do is reach out and take my hand, one step at a time. Looking into his eyes, I can see the honesty there, but I can also see the desperation. I've done this to him, to us, and a lesser man would have given up a long time ago. I don't deserve you, Beck. I don't. I know this. I've been a bitch. I've pushed and pushed, closing him out. I can see it now, and my heart breaks for all the time he's wasted on me. Why didn't you just give up? I'm so messed up, Beck. So messed up. I can't even remember half the times you came running when I called because the desire to let the fear get the best of me was too strong. But you did, every single time. Even when I tried bringing other men around to make you mad enough to leave for good, you wouldn't budge. How can you stand by my side, even from a distance, for so damn long and not hate me? Hell, I hate me. I take a deep breath and wipe away a few tears before looking up and meeting his gaze. When I see the emotion and adoration in his eyes, I let out a small gasp. He pushes his chair back and stands, walking the short distance to my chair. 
I don't look up, but keep my eyes still trained to the spot he just vacated. D, stand up. I don't move. D. I can't move. I just let it all hang out, and I'm not sure if I'm ready to hear what he's about to say. Denise. His tone is harder this time. Clearly, he's losing his patience. I sigh, push my chair back, stand, and turn slowly to look at his chest. Eyes up here, D. His tone is still hard, but I can hear it, the emotion giving his voice a slight wobble. When I meet his eyes, they are shining brightly, and his lips are curved into a small smile. My breath catches in my throat. He is looking at me like Axel looks at Izzy, and Greg looks at Melissa. He is looking at me as if I am the only woman on earth. I stand by your side because this is where I meant to be. I stand by your side because you didn't have the strength to hold yourself up. That's what you do for the person you love. Right after the attack, we were so fresh, but I knew that our relationship was worth fighting for. For months, you would have nightmares, and every time you would wake up, it was my name you were screaming to help you. You aren't messed up, baby. You lived through something terrible, and you needed time to process that. Your mind needed time to heal. I'm not going to lie and tell you I wasn't hurt when you pushed me away. I just spent eight months at your side trying to be who you needed, but I understand that you had to find your own way. He frames my face in his warm hands, his thumbs brushing the tears that are falling from my eyes in rapid succession. Every single time we would get back together, I thought for sure you were back, you'd be ready for us, and I won't lie, when I would wake up in the morning expecting to find you naked in my bed only to meet cold sheets. That hurt. Then I would see you a few days later, and that pain would still be there like a neon sign in your eyes. That pain is gone now. Not even one trace of it is left. Even after all the stuff that went down in your office, it's gone now. You need a little more time to figure it out for yourself? That's fine. But you're going to be doing it with me. Right here. He bends down and presses the softest of kisses against my lips before pulling back and smiling. Understand now? I nod. Good. Now let's eat. I sit lamely and eat my breakfast. Because after all that, I'm positive I wouldn't be able to form a word anyway, much less argue with him. Every single thing he just said is true. I don't remember a lot of the early months after Brandon's attack, but I do remember needing him like a life raft. And after all the running, the therapy, the fear, I can also feel that the webs I've been trapped in have cleared— it's almost as if this recent attack has proven to me that I am strong enough to fight for my own happiness. Most importantly, I feel like it's possible now. After breakfast, I clean up our mess and continue to try processing what the hell just happened. Ever since his grand speech, my mind is spinning, and my heart is beating like a marching band has invaded my chest. Can I forget everything I've ever thought? Is it possible that maybe I've just had the worst luck possible when it comes to men, and that he really is this perfect? Even the reasons I've used to push him away in my mind don't hold true anymore. There's no way he could ever be like Brandon, that bastard. There is no way that he would ever treat me like my father treated my mother and me. All he's ever shown me is love. I put the last dish in the dishwasher and finish wiping down the counter— the only things I can do now is wait and see if I can convince my head that my heart has been right all along, and then take the leap. The only problem is, I'm just not sure if I can turn off the part of me that keeps thinking he's better off without me, and my many suitcases of emotional baggage. I spend the rest of the day in my head. I know he's giving me time to think and take in everything he said, because he hasn't come out of his office since this morning. One thing I know for sure, if I'm going to do this— I need to let go of my past. That means that I need to finally have that conversation with my parents that I've been avoiding since I graduated high school. And I also need to have the one conversation with Izzy that I know might be the hardest one I need to face. In order to give back all of me, I need to let go of the pain two men in my past have caused me, my father and Brandon. With a new resolve and the clarity to make it happen, I call Izzy and make plans to meet tomorrow for lunch— and then I call my mother, only to leave a message with her staff requesting an appointment. She must have another new housekeeper, because when I said my name, she didn't even know who I was. For the first time that I can remember, it doesn't even hurt that my own parents have wiped my existence from their house. 
I feel lighter than I have in years, and it feels liberating. When I look in the mirror and see my eyes shining with life, I feel hopeful that I might be able to face the past and win this time. Knowing that I have a one-man army standing at my back has me convinced that I can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel I've been trapped in. Later that night, when Beck finally comes out of the office for dinner, he takes one look at me, and I know he sees the change. Because after he looks down at the floor for a few seconds, he looks back into my eyes with the biggest smile plastered on his face. Well, all right, he says, giving me a hug just shy of painful. Yeah, I can do this. For this man who's been fighting for us alone, I'm finally ready to start fighting with him. Chapter 14 Back I didn't expect to see you actually come into work. I was half tempted to just send these bastards to your house for the meeting today. Axel's laughing voice carries all the way down the hall when I walk into the office the next day. I knew when I came in today that I would have to deal with comments like this. Hell, I've been gone for almost a month, so they've been a long time in coming. Very funny. I'm here now, so let's get started. Where's Maddox? Coop asks, coming into the conference room with a box full of donuts. I reach out to take one, but before I grab it, he slaps me on the hand like an unruly child. Mine? He growls. You're so fucked up, I laugh. I turn back to the group when they all start laughing. Everyone's here except Maddox, and I can tell by the look Axel's giving me that he didn't know about this. Damn it. Uh, Maddox isn't coming because he's with D. Jesus Christ, are you serious? I get it. You wanting to make sure she's safe. I really do. I can understand you being worried about her, but this is getting ridiculous. You're gone for weeks, and hey, I can't get pissed because you're keeping your cases current and shit gets done, but now you have Maddox babysitting her so you can pop in and say fuck you very much? When Axel finishes, it takes all my strength to remain in my seat. Why I thought these assholes would understand, when they haven't seen shit going on right under their own noses for years, is beyond me. Hell, they just see D being in the wrong place at the wrong time. They don't know shit, and it is making me see red. You know what? I'm going to let that shit slide because you don't know the whole story. But if you ever question my actions when it comes to D, I won't hold back when I beat your fucking ass. I look around and meet all three sets of eyes looking at me in shock. Hell, Coop still has a donut hanging out of his mouth, just looking at me like I've lost my damn mind. Okay, I'm sorry, but just don't go there. I finally say after I calm myself down slightly. Yeah, I'm sensing that might be a sore subject. Greg laughs, trying to lighten the mood. You think? This douche lord just had a PMS fit, and all you're saying is it might be a sore subject. <laughs> That's some funny shit. Coop finishes stuffing his food in his mouth and ignores the rest of us. Want to tell me why Maddox is with D instead of sitting in on this meeting? The meeting that was supposed to be a brief on all this shit we've been investigating for D? Axel's tone is less angry now, and more confused. I should just lay it all out, but what goes on between D and myself isn't their business. Not that stuff. Not until she wants it known. He's with D because you called me and said I needed to get my ass over here. You asked, and I'm here. Maddox is there because she trusts him. And right now, that's all I need to ease my mind when I can't be there. You've got Izzy, he's got Melissa and Cohen, and this idiot has his insatiable dick to worry about. Are you telling me that one of you would have been there to make sure she's safe? I continue my sweep of the room. Axel's earlier anger seems to be coming back, and Greg's carefree attitude is gone. Yeah, might as well just keep pissing them off this morning. I look at Coop to see him searching under the table and not even paying attention. Unwrapping my fingers from their white-knuckle grip on the chair arm gives me a few seconds to figure out just how I want this to play out. I can continue to let them think I've been following D around like a lost puppy, or I can give them enough to have them off my back without betraying her trust in me. Huh, found you, motherfucker! My head snaps over to Coop, who climbs back up from the floor, blowing on the donut he must have dropped. 
He finally notices how thick with tension the room has become, because he looks at all of us with one brow cocked for a few seconds, before he shrugs his shoulders and stuffs his mouth with half of his rescued snack. That's disgusting, Coop, Axel grumbles from across the table. Whatever, he mumbles around a mouthful. What the hell has all you fuckers getting all twitchy? Greg looks like he just shit his pants. He laughs, but continues eating without care. Pretty typical Coop. He hates getting into our shit, always has. He's always preferred to be the lover of the group. It's just turned into a different kind of loving as of late. Do you maybe want to explain to me why I feel like I just got in trouble with Daddy? Axel asks sarcastically. Not really. I cross my arms over my chest and pray that I have the strength to stay in my seat if they continue with this conversation. Fuck that. Maybe let's go with why you would think I wouldn't be worried about D when I've been around a lot longer than you have. You're acting like you have some claim to her, and we all know she moved on from whatever fun y'all had early on. Just like that, I jump up from my seat and slam my palms down on the table with a loud pop. Axel looks on as if he is bored with the conversation. I don't have to look at Coop to see that he's stopped eating and has finally given up his attention. But Greg? This motherfucker has the balls to actually look smug. He stands up, and with the table between us, moves in so he's right at my face before he continues running his mouth. What? Hit a little too close to home there, Beck? Maybe it's time to stop trying to get her to notice you. Stop feeding into her games. I held my tongue when you told me not to drive up when she was in the hospital, but I'm getting sick and fucking tired of watching you two play your little high school bullshit. I don't even give him a second to take a breath after he delivers that pile of shit. I reach back and clock him right in the jaw with enough power to have him on his ass. I palm the table again and swing my legs over, landing right next to his fallen form. What the fuck? Axel stands and moves to pull me away from Greg, but stops in his tracks when I look up and meet his eyes. Don't you even think about touching me right now. You might have me in size, but right now, I've got anger on my side, and I'll level you on the goddamn ground if you take one more step. I turn back to where Greg is leaning against the conference room wall, wiping the blood from his lip. I can see the anger in his eyes, but he looks more confused as to why I just laid him out. We've fought before, all of us have, but never have I laid my hands on one of my brothers in anger. Leaning in close enough that he knows I'm serious. I keep my voice low and level. Do not sit here and pretend to even have a clue what's been going on between Dee and me. I'm going to say this once, and only once, because it still makes me so fucking mad to even think about it. I take a deep breath, not once breaking eye contact with Greg. I want him to understand why I'm livid. Months. Greg. Hell, close to a year and a half, that woman has needed you, and you couldn't even fucking see it. You have no idea what the hell she's been going through, and I'll tell you right now, if you want to know, that's up to you, but you won't hear it from me. What I will clue you the fuck in on is that these games you think I've been feeding into, these games kept the woman I love alive. They helped her heal. And more importantly, these games you think I'm playing give me more claim on her than you ever had. Do not ever question my relationship with D when you have no clue what the hell you're talking about. He keeps staring at me, his jaw hard and his eyes spitting fire. Right when I think he's decided to pout in the corner instead of responding, he opens his mouth. You're really gonna stand there and act like you haven't been so pussy-whipped for two stupid fucking years? Hell, you have it so bad you can't even see it. Don't keep running your mouth because you're pissed I laid your ass out. He climbs to his feet and moves forward so that we're toe-to-toe. -to -toe. I keep flexing my fist, trying to purge the violence from my body. Not running my mouth, Beck. Can't handle a little truth? We've all seen her running around, dating, laughing, and having fun. You can't sit here and act like she's been living two lives. I would have noticed if she needed me. My jaw drops after that load of shit, and then I laugh. I laugh so hard that I have to step away from him and hold my sides. It takes me a few minutes because the anger is still very much present. Holding my hand up to tell him to wait gives me a few seconds to compose myself. 
I just stand here, hunched over, trying to get my breathing under control. Now that the hilarity of just how blind he is to someone he claims to know and love like a sister has passed, and I sober quickly. You know, I don't know who I feel more sorry for right now. D, for hiding behind all that false happiness because she didn't think you could be bothered to be there. Or you. You're the one who claims to love her like family, but you're so fucking stupid that you couldn't see it. I throw my hands up and walk away from him before I'd knock his ass back on the ground. I can even overlook the time that you met Melissa and the shitstorm that followed. You had your own heavy issues, and believe me, brother, I get they were as heavy as it gets. But before that, there was almost a year that you couldn't see shit. Hell, maybe you did and just didn't care, because, hey, she was still smiling, right? I throw his words back at him and turn to Axel. He's just standing there, but now he's looking at me with all the questions I knew he would have if I opened this can of worms. Fuck you, Beck. What gives you the right to sit here and act like you're better than any one of us? Greg growls at me, but makes the mistake of grabbing my shoulder to get my attention back on him. I turn quicker than he expected and grab him by the front of his tee, pushing him back into the wall hard enough that I swear I hear the wall crack. I gained that right the first time I had to stop her from swallowing a bottle of pills. I shove off, pissed at myself for giving in to him when he clearly wanted to bait me. I've got a lot of anger built up about this, Greg, and it would really be wise if you shut the fuck up. Now! I pace the length of the room, my hands on my hips, and my breathing still coming rapidly. I think it's time you cleared the air, brother, Coop says from the table. I look over and meet his eyes. He gives me a small nod, and the tension in my shoulders drops. Fuck! I kick over one of the chairs before turning back and walking over to my seat. Greg, still clearly pissed, writes his chair and sits. Axel keeps his gaze on me for a few seconds before taking his seat next to Greg. I laugh at the irony of those two on one side and me, alone on the other. Coop clears his throat from his seat at the head of the table, and I take that as my signal to talk. This isn't my place to tell you, and I feel like I'm betraying D by even opening my mouth. The fight, all that anger, leaves in seconds, and I just feel alone. It sure would make it a lot easier if we understood what the fuck that shit was all about, Axel says in frustration. I don't like my loyalties being questioned, Beck, and I damn sure don't like being punched in the face. Melissa's going to kick your ass, pregnant or not. Honestly, you deserved that and more, Greg. I've kept my mouth shut out of respect for Dee, but mainly because I had it covered. I was there when she needed me, and I will continue to be there for her. I turn my attention to Axel, taking a deep breath before addressing him. First, I mean no disrespect, Ax, for what I'm about to say, so understand that and keep your temper in check. He gives me a tight nod. Looking back over at Greg, I continue. Right before that shit went down in Izzy and Dee's old townhouse, Dee and I started dating. It was new, so new that we didn't even get to announce shit to anyone before that all went down. Then, with Greg in the hospital, almost dying and shit, there wasn't a good time. Izzy needed Axel, and Greg was healing, so Dee was alone. What the hell do you mean she was alone? She lived in my damn house. Izzy was there. I was there. She wasn't alone. Axel's growl pretty much confirms what I thought. Of course, he's defensive. I told you, I didn't mean any disrespect, Axel, and I mean it. But even though she was right under your nose, you were so busy with Izzy that you didn't see a thing. Think back, and I mean really think. How many times would she sit in that little corner in your office that you gave her to work? How many nights would you catch her roaming around downstairs? Really think about what you couldn't see, because your whole focus was Izzy. I'm not even faulting you there, because Izzy needed you, but Dee needed someone, too. I look down and gather my thoughts. I hate thinking back to those months. She would call me every night, and I listened to her cry herself to sleep. Every single noise in your house terrified her. Then, I finally talked her into getting the apartment in Maddox's complex, thinking she would be better off. I spent another few months never leaving her side. I have to stop and clear the lump in my throat. 
Jesus, this is harder than I thought it would be. The first time, she almost took her own life. She called me first. It gave me enough time to get there, and it took me almost a week to calm her down enough to get help. She only tried once after that, but she had me there. That happened a month before she pushed me away. She started seeing a therapist, and I kept a close eye on her. It's taken almost a year for me to see the signs of life coming back into her. She hid it, but if you all would have taken a good look at her, you would have seen just how broken she was. I look up to meet their eyes. Coop has a look of understanding on his face that makes me think he wasn't as clueless as I thought he had been. Axel's face is clear of emotion, but I can see the shock in his eyes. When I finally meet Greg's eyes, the raw pain that is washed over his features shocks me. I had no idea. His voice even sounds flat. Yeah, I know. I offer him a small smile, but no understanding. These people should have seen it, and knowing they've thought she was playing games just breaks my heart for her. Those games you think she was playing, the guys she was dating, all of it. That was her way of acting like she's fine so you all wouldn't ask questions. She didn't want you to know, and I still don't even know why she was so determined that you all stay clueless. What can we do? Axel's holding it in tight, but he looks like he's about to start breaking things soon. He doesn't like his family hurting, and he's got to know that when Izzy finds this out, it's going to be hard for her to know she's been just as blind as the rest of them. You three don't do shit. She trusts Maddox. I know she's already talked to him about some of this, but I don't know how much she's told him. Plus, with him knowing everything that's been going on, it all makes it easier for her to talk to him. She's meeting with Izzy for lunch today, so Axel, I wouldn't be surprised if you're needed not long after. Right now, D is mine, and I'll keep doing what I've been doing. We figure out who this motherfucker is, and he's mine to deal with. Then we move on like the family we are. They nod their heads in understanding, but Greg pushes back from the table. He pulls the door open, walks out, and slams it behind him. Give him a second to get a handle on this. You can't expect him to just brush off the fact that he's basically ignored D when she needed him. Axel's right. At this point, it's a toss-up for who's going to handle this better, Greg or Izzy. It takes almost thirty minutes before Greg comes back in. He walks up to where I'm standing by the window and pulls me into a hug. I slap him on the back a few times and let him have this. As frustrated as I am with him, I know how seriously he takes his relationship with the females in his life. I knew it wouldn't be easy for him to know that someone needed him, and he didn't see it. Don't beat yourself up, Greg. She's on the other side of it now. Even after that shit at the office, she's got this strength about her that makes me know she's going to be okay. He pulls back and looks at me with pain, clear in his eyes. Thank you for being there for her when I couldn't see it. I nod my head and we return to the table. I know this isn't over. Dee's going to have to finish this and forgive him before they can move on. And judging by the look on his face, he knows this too. We spend the rest of the morning going over what we know about her attack, which basically is pretty much nothing. Adam Harris hasn't been back to work since the Friday before the attack. Everything is still in his apartment, except it's been trashed as though he had to leave in a hurry. His family doesn't have one clue as to where he could be. Dee's attacker had parked far enough from her office that his vehicle didn't get caught on any of the security footage, and he never took his mask off when in range of the cameras. We have nothing, and all I take away from this meeting is the feeling deep in my gut that this is going to get worse before it gets better. Chapter 15 D. I'm more nervous for my lunch date with Izzy than I thought I would be. I know this isn't going to be a fun catch-up and gossip date. She's going to be devastated when I tell her everything I've hidden from her. Beck left this morning worried for me because he knew what would happen today, but he also left knowing that I needed to do this alone, and he never once questioned me. I can only hope that when he gets home and I tell him what I have to tell Izzy, that he's still willing to stand by my side. It's time for me to free myself of all this pain. I've just stepped out of the shower when I hear a knock on the door. I think about locking myself in the bathroom and hiding, 
but after a few seconds of calming my breathing, I'm able to fight the panic. Dressing quickly in the sweats and tea that Beck had left on the floor this morning, I set off for the door with only a slight tremble in my limbs. As silently as I can creep up to the door and look through the peephole, when I see Maddox glaring at the solid wood, I smile slightly, take a deep breath to calm my nerves, and open the door. Hey, Mad, I smile and stand back for him to enter. Hey, he looks me over, his lips twitching just barely, before heading off in the direction of the kitchen. I'm going to get ready, okay? I call after his retreating form. Yep. I shake my head and lock the door before heading back upstairs. It takes me longer than normal to get ready. What does one wear to lunch, knowing that you're about to rip your best friend's heart to pieces? I settle for a pair of skinny jeans, a teal blouse, and my favorite teal four-inch heels. Light makeup and a few motivational pep talks later. I'm ready to take on the day. Izzy's on her way, I tell Maddox when I enter the kitchen. He's standing next to the stove, eating some of the bacon left from breakfast. Do you want a plate? Maybe let me make you something fresh? I know, and no. Uh, okay. You know you don't have to be here, right? I'll be okay by myself. I smile, letting him know that I really will be okay, but he doesn't move. He just looks at me with those scary eyes, finishes the last two pieces and washes his hands. You might think you're okay to be alone, but I'm still going to be here. You and Izzy do your thing, and if you need me when you're done until Beck gets home, then I'll be here. If not, then I'll still be here. And with that, he turns and makes his way through the house. I hear him settling in the living room, the TV click on, and the low sounds of some sports crap fill the air. Well, okay then. I set about cleaning the kitchen, trying to keep my mind clear. Izzy comes bouncing in about an hour later with a wiggling Nate on her hip, and what looks like her whole house in the bag around her shoulder. Hey, you. She drops the bag and sets Nate on his feet before coming over to give me a hug. I missed you. Beck seems to only want to keep you all to himself. I try to smile, but the butterflies in my gut are going crazy. She notices and gives me a weak smile. I look away from her when I hear Nate's little feet take off and the sounds of his squealing. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, she echoes my thoughts. We both stand here, staring at Maddox, who has Nate up in the air, and he has the biggest smile I've ever seen on his face. His whole demeanor changes right before us. The hard, unapproachable look that he normally wears is gone, and replaced with a man seriously too good-looking for his own good. I can see why Emmy is so hung up on him, she whispers in my direction. You aren't lying. We both laugh, and Maddox jerks his head in our direction. The carefree smile that was on his face only seconds before is now long gone. He almost looks mad that he ever let it appear in the first place. I'll take Nate while you two do your chick stuff. He takes off with a giggling Nate in his arms. I hear a door click in the distance, and know he must have gone down into the basement where Beck keeps all his workout equipment. So I'm guessing that we aren't actually eating, huh? She lets a nervous laugh bubble out, but stops when I look at her and shake my head. I didn't think so. I just knew somehow that you didn't want to catch up. Come on, it's a pretty day, so why don't we go sit out in the sunroom? She grabs a water bottle out of the diaper bag and follows after me. Just spit it out, Dee. It's killing me. All night I was worried about what you wanted to talk about. I could tell by the tone in your voice that something's going on, but I can't figure out for the life of me what it could be. Her green eyes look so dark when she's worried. She's biting on her lip and fidgeting with her hands. I start at the beginning and tell her about my parents, the boys I used to date, and how all those relationships ended. I tell her about how I didn't have any real friends until the day I met her. She takes it all in, nodding her head a few times here and there to let me know she's listening. I can tell she's getting upset when I mention how bad things have been growing up with my parents, but she kept silent. Then I tell her everything I've only spoken about to Dr. Maxwell and Maddox about— I finally reveal the secrets about her ex-husband that I have held in for so long. She only lets out a few shocked gasps, her hand shooting out to hold mine when I relate how he broke into my office and beat me. I should have done more to get you out, Izzy. I was just so scared of what he would do. I could see it in his eyes. I don't know how I knew, but I just did. I sat by and let him hurt you, Izzy. When I meet her troubled gaze and see the tears in her eyes, it breaks my heart and the tears that I have been holding back start falling freely. You've been beating yourself up this whole time, haven't you? I nod my head, but before I can open my mouth, she interrupts. 
Brandon was a sick man, D. You have no idea how much it hurts to know he got his filthy hands on you. But nothing that happened during my marriage is your fault. She tries to keep her emotions in check, but the tremble in her voice gives her away. I pause for a second to get ready to finish my story and gaze out on the beautifully landscaped backyard. I must have been silent for a while, because her whispered question makes me jump. What aren't you telling me, Dee? I know you. There's more, isn't there? Her voice is begging me to prove her wrong. Yeah, there's more. I take another breath and look back over to see her face awash with pain. When he finally got done using his fist, he told me that if I tried to contact you in any way, that he would kill you, I whisper on a sob. Her tears are coming quickly, and I know I have to get the rest out before she starts to cry in earnest. And then, then he took the only thing left to take from me. She starts shaking her head, begging me to shut up. I'm sorry, so sorry I wasn't there when you needed me, but he said he would kill you. I tried to keep my eyes on you, but I was so terrified that if I even tried to warn you, he would take you from me completely. Her body is heaving with her sobs, and it's hard to tell who is crying louder at this point. She grabs me and pulls me into a tight, painful hug. We sit there rocking together for a while before she pulls back. He raped you, didn't he? She asks a few minutes later her voice calm despite the fact that her hands are shaking violently. Yeah, he did. If she had jumped slightly, I wouldn't have thought that she heard me since I'd spoken so lightly. I'm trying to process this, I really am. I can't even wrap my head around all this, Dee. Why didn't you tell me years ago, even after he was gone? Did you think I would blame him? God, never! I'm upset because you had to go through that alone. She wipes her eyes with her shirt and tries to calm herself down. You're like my sister, Dee. Why couldn't you tell me? Because I didn't know how. It seems so simple now, looking back. But then, all I saw was another man turned monster. It wasn't even about the rape, Izzy. That was terrible, but I survived it. I was worried about you and what would happen if I didn't find a way to save you. She grabs my hand and holds it tightly. You did save me. That night that I called to you, you saved my life that day and every day after. I wish you had told me about this years ago. But thank you for telling me now, for trusting me with this. We sit here both with our own pain for a few minutes when I feel her hand constrict against mine. You aren't done, are you? If you were done, you wouldn't look like that. Her eyes are wide and panicked with the unknown fear of what else I have to tell her. I'm not done. Jesus, D. she shakes her head in disbelief. Tell me, please. Her pleading voice gives me the last push I need. I tell her about the pain I suffered after Brandon's final attack, how his attack clicked some switch inside of me, how it made me feel like I was drowning in the nightmare that he created, how I had no hope in my escape. I tell her all about my fight with depression and concerning what the doctor has diagnosed as PTSD brought on by the attack. For a second, I think I need to stop, or fib a little and downplay how bad I got mentally, but I know that I need to get this all out in order to move on. She's crying, sobbing and gasping for air by the time I finish. My God, Dee! She grabs me and pulls me in tight again, crying into the crook of my neck. I'm so sorry. I've been so wrapped up with Axel and Nate and life that I've been a terrible friend. No, Iz, you haven't been a terrible friend. You've just had other priorities, and I never blamed you, not once. Please don't think that. I didn't tell you this to make you upset. I told you this because without letting it out, I will never be able to move on. I want to move on. I'm ready to fight for my happiness now, and I couldn't do that with this between us, even if you didn't know it was there. I'm so proud of myself for getting that out without a single tear. I hate seeing Izzy upset but knowing that I'm strong enough to get through that and to let her know how hard the last few years have been gives me a feeling of peace that I didn't have before. I'm one step closer to being healed, and it makes me feel like a whole new person. I don't know how you can ever forgive me for not seeing how much pain you were in, she whispers, staring off into the yard. Izzy, that's easy. There isn't anything to forgive. I love you. She gives me a smile. 
wipes her eyes again with her shirt, and reaches out to hug me again. Please tell me there isn't anything else. There isn't. I know it's not easy to hear, but thank you for listening. You have no idea how scared I've been to tell you all of that. She leans up and gives me a weak smile. Don't keep things from me again. I understand where your head was in keeping that to yourself. But don't do that again. You're one of the most important people in my life, Dee, and I don't ever want you to think there's something you can't tell me. I know that now. It's taken me a lot of really expensive doctor appointments to really understand that, though. I'm done hiding and keeping parts of myself from those that love me. We sit here silently for a while, just offering each other the strength that we need. I know she's hurting, and there really isn't anything I can do about it. She's my best friend, my sister, and one of the most important people in my life. But this is something she has to take and process on her own, with the help of the husband that loves her to get past it. It's a shock, and I know she's going to be upset about this, understandably so, but I also know that our friendship is that much stronger, because there isn't a single thing standing between us now. She gets up to leave about an hour later, and when I watch her drive off, I do it with the clarity that everything is going to be just fine. Chapter 16 D. D, are you up there? I smile and drop down further in the tub, enjoying the soothing effects the warm water is having on me. D, I can hear him panicking slightly when I don't answer right away. I'm in the bathroom. I yell through the crack in the doorway. I could let him wonder where I am, but I know he's worried. It wasn't easy to get him to leave this morning to begin with, so it would be cruel to make him search longer than he has. He comes bursting through the door and skids to a stop when he sees me sitting in the bath, bubbles surrounding me. I gave him a wide smile and enjoy the fact that his body visibly shudders. Jesus Christ, he mumbles under his breath. He found me. I laugh and his eyes shoot up from where they've been staring at my chest. I make sure that I'm still covered under the bubbles before looking back at his face. He clears his throat a few times and adjusts himself. I laugh when I see how much just being in this room is affecting him. Are you okay, Beck? I ask, pushing myself up in the tub. He looks like he might pass out as my naked breasts clear the bubbles. My nipples harden instantly when I see the look of pure lust that comes over him. Dee, if you don't want to start anything, then please cover yourself up. His voice is just shy of begging. My body heats up when I see the outline of his erection against his jeans. My mouth waters, and I have to press my thighs together to keep from touching myself. Don't look at me like that, he pleads. Like what? I question in mock ignorance. You're looking at me like you haven't eaten in years, and I just brought you a steak dinner. He sounds strained almost to the point of pain. I smile at him and give him one more slow caress with my eyes. Will you please hand me a towel? He presses his palm against his crotch and groans when he turns to grab the towel I've left in the sink. He stands there with his hand clenched tightly against it and his head bowed. The water is almost completely gone by the time he turns back around with his eyes pinched shut. You have no idea what I would do to be able to carry you off to the bed and show you for hours how much I've dreamed of this moment. It's been six long months since I've been inside that tight body. And when I have you again, and believe me, baby, I will have you again. It's going to be forever this time. He opens his eyes, and the fire I see blazing deep within takes my breath away. Mutely, I nod my head and accept the bath sheet he's holding out. He leans in and plants a swift kiss against my lips before walking towards the open door. When I notice the slightly awkward way he's walking, a nervous giggle bubbles out. I slap my hand over my mouth to try to stop myself, but he turns and narrows his eyes at me. This isn't funny, Dee. I'm so hard right now that I wouldn't be surprised if my balls are turning blue. I'm sorry. Really. I hold my hands up in surrender, but notice my mistake about two seconds too late. The towel falls from my body and pools around my feet, leaving me standing before him completely naked. He growls low in his throat the sound so powerful that my pussy throbs. Jesus, that's hot. With more willpower than I thought possible, he turns stiffly and walks the rest of the way out the door, closing it softly behind him. 
I spend the next thirty minutes trying to calm my own hormones down, but quickly realize there isn't much that can soothe the inferno raging inside me. I want him with an all-consuming thirst. After our bathroom incident, we walk on eggshells around each other. Both of us dance around, knowing that behind each stolen glance and heated glare, we both want nothing more than to collide together in what promises to be the wildest of reunions. When he looks at me again like he's just finished fucking me against the countertop that I'm fixing dinner on, I slam my knife down. The sexual heat between us has the room thick with tension. It almost feels like a fog of desire is cloaking every inch of space around us. I think I might need to skip dinner. He puts the plates down and walks over from where he was setting the table. I don't move. I continue to hold the marble countertop as if my life depends on it, afraid that if I remove my hands even for a second, that I might shred the clothes straight from his body. I don't feel him at first, but I know he's standing directly behind me. I can feel him and his body heat warming my back. I fight the urge to turn and throw myself at him. When his hand moves my hair off my shoulder and his lips press lightly against my exposed neck, my body trembles violently. I want you so bad, Beck. The desperation in my voice causes my cheeks to heat and I drop my head, annoyed with my body for its shamelessness. And I want you right back just as much, so don't think this isn't hard on me, too. But I'm not going anywhere, Dee. You might think you're ready, and I have no doubt that your body is, but I want it all, mind, body, soul, and heart. I promise you that when we finally get there, it's going to be worth the wait. When you open yourself up to me completely, baby, you won't even believe how good it's going to be. He nibbles softly across my neck before backing away and picking up the plates he'd abandoned. It takes me longer to calm the heat in my body. I understand where he's coming from but it's harder to explain to my overactive hormones that we need to put the brakes on it. The last time I had him inside of me was another moment of weakness, and even though it was mind-blowing as always, it still left me unsatisfied because I ran off in the middle of the night. Six months is a long time to crave someone else. I pause in my tracks when the very vivid images of him with someone else come floating through my mind. I don't know why it never occurred to me that he could have been with anyone else, but now that the thought has popped in my head, there is no erasing it. My stomach cramps with the idea of him and some faceless woman. Beck, he turned with a frown marring his handsome face, cocking his brown question. I gulp, trying to calm my emotions. I have no right to ask this. I know I don't, but has there been someone... Um, anyone else? I whisper the question but I know he hears me because his face goes soft. His lips curl into a smile and his eyes darken. Are you jealous? I glare at him when his teasing tone hits me. Don't poke fun at me, Beck. I know that I have no right to even be bothered by the thought, much less question you on it. I pushed you away and I get it, I do, but I just want to know, I need to know. He doesn't walk over to me and I appreciate that he's giving me some space here. My mind is a jumbled mess of questions. On one hand, I know without a doubt that this is where I'm meant to be. I don't fear that he will change any more, but I'm still afraid of the unknown. I know now that this is normal with any relationship, but it's still there, knowing that I pushed this man away for so long, regardless of what I've had going on in my head, is what kills me. I wouldn't even fault him if there had been someone else. Look at me, Dee, and I mean really look at me. He gives me a second, and I just look into his eyes, waiting for his next words. The day your drunk ass went on and on about how chocolate is better than sex, you had me hooked. It was never a question of whether or not you were it for me, I knew. You might have pushed me away physically, but I didn't really go anywhere. And if you think about it long enough, you know I didn't leave you. Even if we hadn't had the handful of nights together during all this time apart, there was no way I would have even been able to get it up for another woman— not when my heart has always been yours. So, no, Dee, there hasn't been anyone else, and there won't be anyone else. This is the longest we've ever gone without falling into each other, and I can wait as long as it takes for your head to catch up with your heart. He smiles, and it isn't a smile of sadness. It's one of acceptance. And right then and there, I know without a doubt that I don't deserve this man. 
but I'll fight like hell to be worthy of the love he's offering. For what it's worth, it's only been you for me, too. I echo his words back at him. His smile gets even bigger before he finishes setting the table. A comfortable silence fills the air, and after sitting down and starting our meal, he clears his throat. I look up, expecting the question I've known was coming, but not sure I'm ready to answer. How did it go with Izzy today? He finishes cutting a piece of his chicken, but pauses within halfway to his mouth when he sees the nervousness take over my face. Telling Izzy what Brandon had done to me had been a painful conversation, but it will pale in comparison to how gutting it will be to tell Beck. I think I've always known that he would be the hardest one for me to tell. I've had a very real fear that he would look at me differently if he knew everything that had played a part in keeping me from him. Like he would think I'm damaged goods, tainted, unworthy. Things would have been a lot easier if I hadn't been afraid to tell him. I took a while, but now I can tell that he would have helped me get over it back then and still would have loved me. It wasn't easy. He nods his head and waits for me to continue. I think that was one of the hardest conversations I will ever have in my life. How did she take it? Better than I thought she would. She'll be okay because it's Izzy. He smiles, returning to his meal for a few bites. We both know how strong Izzy is now, and since she has Axel standing by her side, I know she'll be able to move past this and not have it affect us. In a way, having the strength to tell Izzy is what gives me the strength to have this conversation with Beck. I would like to tell you what we talked about, if that's okay. I rush the last part out so that I don't wuss out before I finish. He stops what he's doing, sets his fork down, and gives me his full attention. I'm done eating if you want to talk now. His eagerness helps give me the final push to talk. He's been waiting for this moment since I closed myself off and pushed him away, patiently waiting for me to open up. Why don't we get everything cleaned up and then go sit somewhere and have a drink? I think you're going to need it. I stand up and do my best to ignore the worried look across his face. I smile when I walk into the kitchen with our dishes, because I know with not one single shadow of doubt that I'm ready to have this conversation. Not only that, but I finally can see with crystal clear clarity that once I get this out, there won't be anything left standing in our way. Chapter 17 D. I finished cleaning up our dinner mess and walked out into the living room where Beck's on the phone with his sister Julie. The phone rang right when we finished up dinner, and even though he's anxious to get our conversation rolling, he answered with a smile. I round the couch and hand him a beer before settling in next to him. He pulls me close with a hand that isn't holding the phone and smiles. Yeah, Jules, I know. I promise that I'll be home to visit soon. Yeah. No, I haven't forgotten how to work a phone. Yeah, she's great. He stops talking and looks into my eyes, giving me a light squeeze so I know she's asking about me. I've talked to Julie, his youngest sister, a few times over the phone, and once when she came to visit. She's such a sweetheart, and we connected instantly. His other sister, Peyton, I haven't met in person, but each time I've spoken to her on the phone, I can tell that she's just like Julie. Both of them share the same huge heart and compassionate soul that Beck has. I think Mom said she'd be driving down to visit sometime next month. You know how she is. She wants to wait until you and Pay can come down with her. He laughs at whatever Julie says in return. I settle into his chest and enjoy the feeling of his voice vibrating against my body. This feels so right, sharing this moment, even though it's just a small one with him. Doing things that normal couples take for granted feels like a huge accomplishment for me. When he hangs up the phone and turns to me, catching my smile, he offers one just as big back to me. What's that smile for? I'm just enjoying the moment. My smile fades when I realize that it's time to have this talk with him. How's Julie? I ask, trying to buy some time to settle the butterflies in my stomach. He gives a snort, shaking his head a few times. Obviously, he knows me well enough to know my stalling tactics. Do you really want to know, or would you rather I sit here and let you calm down a little while before we talk? He isn't mad, just being honest. You really do know me, don't you? I laugh softly. I really do want to know how she is, but I do also need a second to collect my thoughts. I understand that. We've got all night. Jules is good. She's complaining about some class she's taken. Keeps going on and on about how she shouldn't have waited until she was twenty-eight to go back and get her degree. She'll figure it out, though. 
She says Mom wants to come down, especially when she found out you had been hurt. Don't worry. I bought her some time. His smile gets big when he talks about his family. He's so lucky to have come from such a loving family. Even without having a father around, there was never a lack of love in his life. I would love to see them again. I don't think I realized how true that statement was until just now. Even though I've only met Julie in person, I have talked to the other ladies in his life a few times when he was teaching his mother how to FaceTime. I would love that, too. I lean back into him, and we both sit here for a few minutes in a comfortable silence. He takes a few deep pulls on his beer, and I spend the time figuring out how to start this chat. I'm really not sure that there is a real easy way to start with this one. I suppose it would be really easy to take the cheap way out and just give you my journal that Dr. Maxwell made me keep. A nervous giggle bubbles up before I can squash it. Okay, let's just start with my father. He sits there and gives me the silence I need, his thumb slowly rubbing against my bare shoulder. The first time my father ever hit me, I was five, and had forgotten to make my bed. That was also the first time of many that he told me that he wished I had never been born. It wasn't easy living with my parents. My mother was just as nasty as he was, except her words were her weapon of choice. I learned real early in life that I would be better off keeping my head down and making sure I did everything they wanted. I steal a glance at him and can tell he's pissed, but holding it in so I can finish. His hand flexes slightly on my shoulder, but when I look over, he nods tensely for me to continue. I know that my father is a seed that started my fear of men and growing relationships. There wasn't a single relationship that I had that wasn't a way for someone to get closer to my father and family money. That helped the belief that men do nothing but change after they get what they want. Dr. Maxwell says that since I hadn't had any positive male relationships until my twenties, and my friendship with Greg, that it makes sense that I have some asinine belief that all men will change. I shift my body so I can look into his eyes. I need to see him and make sure he understands this next part. Please know that I see this now. I really do. I know that I was projecting my fears onto you, but they were so deeply integrated that I don't think I would have been able to just shut them off. And you have no idea how sorry I am for that. He smiles sadly and takes my hands in his. I know that, baby. I never doubted that you were fighting something beyond your control. God, I don't deserve your understanding. Hey, stop that. Don't doubt your self-worth, not with me. His tone leaves no room for argument, and I nod my head. I'm learning that. Sometimes I feel like I'm completely lost because I have no idea what I'm doing here. But I can tell you aren't like them. It's just taken me a while. I shouldn't have ever lumped you in with them. Dee, we can only ever go off what we know, and you hadn't ever seen anything that would make you believe that I wasn't like those assholes. I sit there for a few more beats, gathering my strength for the next part. Did I ever tell you that I was the one that introduced Brandon and Izzy? His eyes widen before he shakes his head. Yeah, that was me. I set up my best friend with the man who almost took her from me. I always wondered what would have happened if I hadn't ever set them up. Until recently, it was nothing but guilt that would eat at me. But Izzy helped me realize that it wasn't anything I could have known. I understand that now, but it isn't any easier. I really thought that he was one of the good guys. I laugh weakly. What a fool I was. He takes my hands again and waits for me to continue. It took about a year into their marriage for me to realize how wrong I had been. She started pulling away, and I saw less and less of her. I didn't give up, though. I kept calling and trying to come around. I think it had been a good week of my constant calls before it happened. I know I was being a pain in the ass, but I just wanted to talk to Izzy. I don't realize I've zoned out until his hand squeezes mine almost painfully. I look up from where I've been staring at our hands. I have to close my eyes when I see the pain in his eyes. He knows this is about to get really ugly. It's okay, Dee. I'm listening. Are you sure you want to know the rest? He nods sharply, and I sigh. I didn't realize until recently, with Dr. Maxwell's help, why I had such a hard time after all that stuff with Brandon went down— I knew I was pushing you away out of fear, but I couldn't even understand it myself. You have to understand that I've never known a positive relationship with a man, so when you started getting close, I freaked out. 
You are so perfect on the outside that it terrified me beyond imagination that you could change just as easily as all the others. I stop when he grunts, but he motions for me to keep going. Right. So with that, you might understand a little better why his attack was a trigger for me. About two years into their marriage, he cornered me. I'll spare you the gory details, but how I looked a few weeks ago, that's close to how he left me. Only he took it a lot further. He shoots off the couch, knocking his beer to the floor. I keep my eyes trained to the foaming liquid pouring out of the overturned bottle. I knew he would look at me differently, but it's still painful to be right. Why would he want someone so fucked up? He put his hands on you? Son of a bitch! If he wasn't already dead, I would fucking kill him. Gut that sorry bastard. He paces in front of the couch, growling each word out with disgust. Fuck! He keeps his pacing up for a few minutes, before he stops in his tracks and looks over at me. Shaking his head, a look of stark terror comes over his features. I watch in slow motion as he figures it out before I can tell him. Somehow he just knows, and when I watch all that anger turn into a pain so great that he drops to his knees in front of me, my world ends. No, no, no! I can't move from my spot on the couch. My chest is heaving with the force of my emotions. My tears burn as they fall down my face and land in my lap. I can't even move to wipe my eyes. He quickly moves over to where I'm sitting. His head hits my lap and his arms wrap around my waist. When his shoulders start to shake with the emotions warring through him, my tears come quicker, and a loud sob breaks free from my throat. That sob seems to break him from his silent misery because he pulls his head up, unwraps his arms and pulls me down into his lap. His strong arms wrap around me again, and he pushes his face into my shoulder. I cling to him, soaking up his heat, trying to warm my body and chase away the pain. He doesn't break his hold on me when he pulls us back up to the couch, still making sure that I'm in his lap and safe in his arms. I'm sorry. I offer weakly. He looks shocked, but desperation bleeds off his face. What? My God, Dee, what do you have to be sorry for? I shrug my shoulders and just shake my head. You've thought this was your fault this whole time? Oh, baby. He pulls me back to his chest and rocks us slightly. What that bastard did to you isn't your fault, Dee. Never your fault. He was a sick, disturbed man. It kills me to think about you going through that and going through it alone. I wish you could have opened up and told me that before, but I understand why you didn't. That's why you kept running. Yeah, I don't think I can ever prove to you how sorry I am for everything that I put us through. I just saw you in all your perfection, and it reminded me of how he was when I had first introduced him to Izzy. I think I always knew deep down that you would never turn on me, but that fear was so ingrained that no matter what I did, I couldn't separate you two. And then when all of that stuff happened, it was like a light switch went off. I knew he was gone, but my mind couldn't turn the fear off. He was everywhere I looked, and every time I looked in the mirror, I could see what he did to me. I punished you because of what he did, and I did it over and over. I paused to wipe my eyes and blow my nose. He keeps silent and lets me finish. It's taken me all this time to push back those feelings, to clear all of the dark webs of my depression. I can't thank you enough for forcing me to start seeing someone, because without that I don't think I ever would have healed. For a while it was a lot of trial and error trying to figure out what worked best with my trauma. Dr. Maxwell tells me that there will still be setbacks. Some people don't ever really beat PTSD, but they do learn how to live with it. And that's what I've been doing. Living with it. I can't sit here and tell you that I'll ever be completely carefree and healed. But these last few weeks with you by my side have given me all the hope I've ever needed that I will get past this. When he still doesn't speak, but just keeps holding me tightly and staring off into the distance, I start to worry that he hasn't hurt me. So I say the only thing I can think of to make him understand where I am now how I'm finally ready for him and all the love he's ever been offering. Your love saved me, I whisper. Chapter 18 Beck Your love 
saved me. Her words keep echoing around me, coiling around the pain that has filled my heart since she started talking. Your love saved me. I can feel her body shaking, and I tighten my hold so she knows that I'm still here, but I can't speak past the lump that's taken up residence in my throat. I always knew that she had a rough history, but never in my wildest imagination could I have pictured all of this pain she's gone through. It makes so much sense now. All the times she pushed me away with fear in her eyes. Every single time she would look at one of the guys and have this odd look about her, as if she was waiting for one of them to go all hulk or something. There is so much swirling around inside of me. I want to kill that motherfucker all over again. I want to go find her father and teach him to pick on someone his own size. I want to lock her away in this house and never let anyone get close enough to so much as give her a paper cut. Your love saved me. All I've wanted since the day I felt her slipping away is to prove to her how much I love her and for her to know that I'm here for her. It kills me to know how greatly she suffered. But with that comes the clarity that she's finally, fucking finally, on the same page with me. I squeeze her tighter into my body when I feel her sobbing get harder. It finally hits me that I haven't said a word since she finished talking. I have to work at swallowing my own sorrow. I wipe the tears from my face and clear my throat a few times until I feel confident that I can talk without breaking down. Baby, look at me. Please look at me. She shakes her head and burrows deeper into my body. Come on, where's my wildcat? I soften my voice, rub her back and kiss her over and over. I'm begging silently for her to just look at me, to see all the understanding and love that she needs from me right now. So she will see that I'm here and will never leave. D, I'm begging you, please, look at me. See me. Let my love in. Please, baby. She has her mouth pressed into my shoulder, so when she speaks I can't understand her. She is still crying, but at least her body has stopped heaving violently. Say it again. I can't understand you. She lifts her head and her tear-filled, puffy red eyes just stare at me. I smile at her, letting her know that it's all going to be fine. And she lets out a shaky breath. She closes her eyes for a few seconds, but when she opens them, and I can see, not only the old D that I've missed with extreme longing shining back at me, but I can also see all of that love that she's been running from. It's staring brightly back at me, and even with her swollen eyes and splotchy face, I've never seen her look more beautiful. Oh, baby, I love you so much. Her breath hitches again at my words. It doesn't take long before she opens her mouth, and when she finally utters the words that I've been dreaming of for so long, the sense of peace that hits me is nothing short of a miracle. I love you too, John Beckett. I love you with all of my scarred heart. She smiles weakly, and I return it with a smile so big that my jaw hurts. You're finally mine? I ask, my smile never leaving my face. No. She pauses, and my heart stops. You are finally mine. All of the earlier pain and sadness drains from her face, and she looks at me with her smile huge, her bloodshot eyes full of love and trust. She looks at me as if she's a brand new woman, and I give a second of thanks that I'm lucky enough to have this woman in my life. Whatever works, but we're finally us. I cup her cheek and guide my lips to hers. She tastes like her tears mixed with hope. She tastes like heaven. I love you. I punctuate each word with a kiss before I take her lips in a slow, lazy kiss. Her hands are running all over my chest, pulling at my shirt. When her cold hands get my shirt up and she presses against my abs, I shake with the chill that rushes through my body. She giggles, and it's like music to my ears. I break away from her mouth to pull my shirt off, and then hers. She unhooks her bra and drops it to the floor. I take a second to look over every inch of her exposed skin, drinking in her tan perfection. 
Her nipples pebble under the attention of my eyes, and I reach up and cup each of her heavy breasts, rubbing my thumb over each nipple before pinching them lightly. Her head rolls back on her shoulders, and she moans low in her throat. I shift her so that she straddles me on the couch and take her ass in my hands before pulling her against my erection. She frames my face before taking my lips and kissing me deeply. Her tongue comes out and tangles with mine while she starts grinding against my lap. I pull my mouth away and lean my forehead against hers. Both of us are panting deeply. When she shifts slightly and her warm core rubs against my painful erection, I growl. D. It'll be over before I even have a chance to get out of my pants if you move again. Give me a second, and then I'm taking you up to our bed and showing you every single ounce of love I have in my body for you. It takes me a lot longer than a second to calm my body enough that I don't fear coming in my pants if she so much as breathes. When I can finally feel some blood coming back to my head, I push my hands under her ass and stand. She instinctively wraps her legs tightly around my waist and drops her head to my neck. She starts kissing, licking, and sucking lightly against my neck, and all the progress I've just made in controlling my throbbing erection just goes flying out the window. D, I warn when she starts sucking on my earlobe. She laughs, and her warm breath dances across my wet ear. I have to stop in the middle of the staircase because the urge to come in my pants is almost too much. My dick has craved this woman for months, and she is finally mine. There's no way in hell I'm going to go off unless her wet pussy is wrapped tight around me. She finally takes pity on me, and I'm able to start climbing the stairs again. When I hit the hallway, it looks a mile long and not the short distance I know it to be. I tighten my fingers against her ass and start walking. Every time my balls rub against the fabric of my jeans, I groan. When we finally cross the threshold into the bedroom, I let out the breath I have been holding. Finally. It's finally time to make this woman mine. I bring my hands from her ass and run my fingertips slowly over her body, up towards her chest. When I hit her hips, her legs tighten around my waist so that she keeps her hold on me. The feel of her warm skin against my palms has me closing my eyes and dropping my head back on my shoulders. She takes the opportunity to run kisses and wet swipes of her tongue against my exposed neck. She nibbles on my throat before dipping and kissing a path to one of my nipples. When her teeth bite down, almost painfully, I tighten my hold on her waist. Walking stiffly over to the edge of the bed, I lower her until her ass meets the mattress. I step back when she places her palms behind her and leans back. Her tits are thrusting in the air, just begging for my mouth. I lick my lips before moving my eyes up her body and meeting her gaze. Her eyes are on fire, cheeks flushed, and all signs of her earlier sadness have completely disappeared. I give her a tip of my lips before dropping to my knees, wrapping my arms around her legs and pulling her until her ass is hanging off the bed. When she falls back on the mattress, she lets out a yelp that quickly turns into a moan as I nuzzle my nose against her stomach and start kissing along the waistband of her jeans. You're killing me, she moans, running her hands up her stomach. I have to stop what I'm doing when she takes her hands on a trail up her body and squeezes her tits before rolling each nipple slowly. Her face is showing me just how much she's enjoying this. Shit. I have to pull one of my hands from her legs to shove it down my pants and wrap my fist around my dick. I press as hard as I dare so that I can stop myself from coming. Just watching her pleasure herself is almost too much to take. D, please stop. She shakes her head back and forth, lost in her own world. D, I snap. Her eyes shoot open and her hands stop caressing and pinching. Please. Let me. You keep that up, and I won't be able to hold back. I don't want you to hold back. It's been too long. God, I love her voice when she's this close to coming. It gets deeper, huskier. Fuck. I don't even try to take my time. I lean forward and pull her pants off with one jerk, tossing them over my shoulder. Her underwear just pisses me off because it's in the way of the one place my body is craving. 
taking hold of one delicate side and tugging has them ripping right off her. I thrust my hand back under her ass, lift her hips off the mattress, and drop my mouth right to her soaked folds. Drenched, baby, so damn wet. Whose pussy is this? I latch onto her clit and suck hard, waiting for her to answer me. Yours, it's yours, oh God. Her small hand pushes through my hair and holds my head still while she brings her hips up and shamelessly rubs against my tongue. I hum when the sweet flavor of her desire hits my taste buds in a rush as she comes all over my tongue. I lick her slowly, lapping up every single drop of her addictive taste before pulling my head from her hand and trailing kisses up her thigh. Seeing her back in this bed, completely naked and in the afterglow of one hell of a climax, as my dick getting even harder than I ever thought possible. My balls are already drawn tight against my body, just ready to explode at any second. I take a step back, never letting my eyes leave her body. She doesn't even move. Both legs still hang off the side of the bed. Her head tips to the side and her brown hair spills out around her. My jeans are the first to go. I unsnap and slowly pull the zipper down, holding my dick back with my other hand so it doesn't go off on a mission of its own to find that delicious pussy. When I'm finally naked, I continue to stand there, slowly drawing my fist up and down my swollen shaft in lazy movements. She finally opens her eyes to see me standing between her spread legs and lets out a whimper that goes straight to my dick, which throbs painfully in my fist. Words aren't needed. Not with us, and definitely not now. Her walls are down. No, they aren't down. They're completely decimated. There isn't a single speck of the pain that's been in her eyes for the past two years. No, my girl has her love shining brightly, and her heart beating in sync with my own. Leaning down, I take her lips in a deep, slow, bruising kiss. Our tongues mate together in a slow dance, and when I press my hips to hers and my dick is nestled between her swollen lips, I moan in her mouth. She breaks her lips away and starts sliding against my dick, letting her wetness coat me in seconds. Her fingers dig into the muscles of my back, almost to the point of pain each time I hit her clit. It doesn't take long before fire starts slowly burning its path down my spine and the first threads of my orgasm start to race through my body. I have to pull my hips from her wet heat, earning me another bite of her nails when she tries to keep me close. Without losing my connection to her mouth, I bring my hands up to her hips and lift her up, scooting her back so I can crawl up behind her. Staying on my knees, I shift her body so she's resting on her shoulders with her hips in the air, right where I need them to be to lean up and enter her. Her hands come back up to her tits and start rolling her nipples again. I lean forward, letting go of one hip long enough to line myself up, and then push forward slowly. We both groan when we come together completely. My balls rest against her ass and her walls hug my dick with a vice-like strangle. God damn, it feels like home. I take a few slow thrusts before the pleasure becomes too much. I hook her legs with my arms, spreading her wide so I can watch her pussy take my dick. Watch as she becomes mine. Look. At. Us. Each word has my hips pounding in until I can feel her lips against my pelvis. I roll my hips and tighten my hold on her legs before sliding out almost completely. I wait for her to look at me before I slam home. Yes, oh f Oh, yes! Her hands slip from her tits and she grabs the bed sheets in her fist, holding onto anything that can anchor her to the world, because if her orgasm is anywhere near as strong as mine is promising to be, she's going to need that hold. I drop her legs and lean forward to press my chest against hers, planting myself deeper inside her walls. My left hand braces the brunt of my weight from her body, while my right hand starts the slow journey from her hip to her neck. I thrust my hand into her thick hair and tilt her head so I can crush my lips to hers. The way her body feels while I'm buried deep is intoxicating. She wraps her legs around me, and I start thrusting in and out. It's painfully slow, but I don't want this to end. I can feel our bodies becoming one. Her heart is beating rapidly against my chest, and mine answers every beat. 
I pull back and look into her eyes, resting my forehead against hers. I watch my body rocking against hers. She brings her hands up and frames my face, bringing my eyes back up. I know she's close, because she's panting and moaning each time I thrust home. She leans up, kisses me softly, and then whispers against my lips. It feels so, so different, baby. She moans when I stop thrusting and roll my hips again, hitting that spot inside her that has a surge of wetness coating my dick. Yeah, that right there is what it feels like to finally be mine. And with that, I pull back and give her body what it's silently begging for. Not long after she screams my name and clamps down on my dick, the thirst that's been burning its delicious pain in my balls rushes out as I empty myself inside her body, giving her everything that I have in me. D. I groan her name and dig my fingers in the soft skin of her hips, thrust a few more times before pushing in one last time, and roll so her body is laid out over my own. Each of us is breathing rapidly, and her tight walls still grip my dick, begging me not to leave. I love you so damn much, she whispers in my ear. I love you too. Always have, and always will. I can feel her smile against my cheek, and with our arms wrapped tightly around each other and our bodies connected, we both close our eyes, and for the first time in a long time, I sleep with complete peace. Part 3. Believing and Letting Go Chapter 19 D. Peace That's what this kind of love feels like. My mind and heart are working together in complete harmony, and I no longer wake up wishing that I could just disappear. I wake up, and the first thing I do is smile because I have been blessed. I still have some bad days, times when I freak out because of some stupid reason, but Beck is always there to remind me that there isn't a thing in the world he won't do to keep me safe and happy. It's been one week since we had our talk, and since then we have spent almost every second together locked away in his house so that the world can't touch us. He called Axel sometime the morning after we let go of everything that was standing between us. I don't think he's happy about it, but he still told Beck to take some time off. Beck left for the office about an hour earlier, and today would mark the first day that we would be apart since he went in for his meeting last week. I brushed him off when he asked me if I needed Maddox to come wait with me. Truth is, I'm still nervous to be alone, but I know I've got to learn to stand on my own two feet without Beck to keep me up. I have to take the steps to rid myself of this fear. The main reason I don't want anyone here is because today I'm calling my parents. Today I'm finally going to let them know how much they've completely ruined the first twenty-plus years of my life. Today... I will put my parents and every single fucked-up issue they have given me to rest and forever forget that they ever existed. After eating something light for breakfast, I settle on the back deck with a phone and a cup of whiskey-flavored coffee. Yeah, I need all the courage I can get. I stare at the phone in my hand before I can make my fingers dial the ten numbers to connect me to my parents. When I press the last number and place the phone to my ear, I take a deep breath for strength and get ready. Roberts Residence, this is Colette speaking. Colette, this is Denise Roberts. May I please speak with Annabeth? I feel the instant need to wash out my mouth when I say my mother's name. It takes everything inside me to speak normally and keep the snark out of my tone. I really just want to ask Colette if I may speak with the raging bitch of the house. One moment, please, Miss Denise. Let me see if the lady of the house is available for callers. She has got to be joking. The lady of the house? What a fucking joke. By the time I'm finally taken off hold and my mother's annoyed voice comes over the line, I'm about to hang up and just say the hell with it. What is it, Denise? I'm in the middle of my bi-weekly massage, so can we make this quick? I pull back the phone and drop my jaw when her words penetrate. Did I really expect anything different? No. I want to laugh when I realize how unnecessary this call is. Well, mother... I'm so sorry that I interrupted your fucking massage. Her gasp comes out, and I can picture her pressing her hand to her chest in shock over her daughter's disgusting mouth, 
You will watch your mouth when you're speaking to me. It's a little too late for mothering, Annabeth, don't you think? She starts to speak, but I cut her off quickly before I lose my lead on this conversation. Here's the thing, you old fucking hag. You might be my mother by birth, but that's only because I didn't get to pick the idiots that decided to have sex once, and nine months later their accident was born. No, I didn't get to pick then, but I do now. I wanted to say this to you for years, but until recently, I didn't have what I needed to make this call. You are a filthy, disgusting piece of shit, and I would have been better off thrown into the system than being raised by you and Davison. I hate you. I've hated you for the last thirty-one years of my life, and for once, the thought of telling you that doesn't send me into a panic. I want you to let Davison know that this will be the last time you ever speak to me. From this day forward, you are dead to me. Do you understand that, Annabeth? Your daughter is dead. I take a deep breath and squeeze my eyes shut. My legs are bouncing in place, and I know I'm seconds away from throwing up. Well, I think an email would have sufficed here. Goodbye, Denise. The click of her hanging up the phone causes me to jump. I can't seem to remove the phone from my ear. The shock that she didn't even react, not once, when I finally let her know what I think about her is overwhelming. I should be sad. Maybe shed a tear or freak out a little. But there is nothing. Nothing but the heavy weight of the pain that they've caused me over the years as it vanishes from inside of me. I grab my coffee off the railing and take a long swallow, enjoying the burn of the whiskey mixed with it. When I pull the mug away from my mouth and feel my lips curve into a smile, I know that everything is finally okay. My life is finally perfect, and there isn't anything that can take this feeling from me. By the time I pull myself off the couch on the back porch, it's nearing lunchtime. Bex already called twice to check on me, and the last time he called I told him he better not call me again. I love him for wanting to make sure that I'm okay, but we both need to start getting back to normal, our normal, together. After a quick lunch, I sit down to start answering emails. I've enjoyed my break from work, my forced break, but now it's time to get back on the wagon, so to speak. The first order of business is to start cleaning shop with the North Carolina branch. I spoke with Chelsea the other day about selling the business and having her move down here to help me run things. I'm ready to stop making work my number one priority and focus on living my life. Ring. Hey, Chels, I was just thinking about you. When I hear her soft sob, the smile on my face vanishes. Chelsea, what's wrong? Oh, God, Dee, I thought it was over, you know. Things have been so quiet around here, but you... You got a letter today. She sounds terrified, and all it does is fuel the dread slowly closing in on me. Chelsea, what did it say? I'm pretty proud of myself for sounding a lot calmer than I feel. I take a few deep gulps to calm myself and wait for her to speak. There are pictures, Dee. They have pictures of you, and they have pictures of me. My heart is beating out of control. Oh, my God. Was there anything else? Tears are streaming down my face, and my hands are shaking so badly that I have no idea how I'm able to hold onto the phone. There's a message, she whispers back. And? It said, God, it said that if you don't deliver Adam or $200,000 by the end of the month, they're going to clear the dead owed in other ways. D. What the hell does that mean? By the time she finishes, she is sobbing. I give myself a few minutes to freak out before trying to come up with a fix. Chelsea, listen to me. I want you to get your things and go straight home. Lock the door and do not answer for anyone. Pack as much as you can and get down here. I need to call back and let him know what's going on, but I want you here where I know you will be safe. She's silent for so long that I have to pull my phone away to make sure she didn't disconnect. Chels, do you understand? Yeah, Dee. I'll be there by tomorrow. Promise me you're safe. Don't worry about me. Worry about you. Get down here, Chelsea. Everything's going to be okay. Make sure you bring everything they mailed you and try not to touch it, okay? I'll be there. I quickly hang up the phone and immediately call back. After I fill him in, he tells me to check every door and stay away from the windows. I know he's worried, but he's trying to hide it so it doesn't freak me out. I'm okay, Beck. I'm really okay. Just get home, okay? I don't think I realized until that moment that I'm not as scared as I would have been months ago, 
I'm worried, but mainly for Chelsea. I know that Beck won't let anything happen to me, and until she gets down here, I don't think I'll be able to stop the feeling that I have no way of controlling what happens here. I check all the doors and make sure the alarm is active before making my way back upstairs. The only place that I know I'll feel 100% safe is in Beck's bed, where I can pull the covers around me and let his scent surround me. Chapter 20 Beck the second that I hang up with D, I gather the rest of the guys in the office so I can fill them in on what's going on. She doesn't know if there's more. The letter didn't come here, which makes me think that he wants her to believe he knows more than he does. There's a reason he sent it to Chelsea at the office and not here. Axel looks around for a second, thinking about all the facts that we have, which is basically a whole lot of nothing. I don't like this. How is it possible for this Adam shit to hide for this long? We need the letter. Maybe we can pull something off of it. It's a long shot, but right now, it's all we have. Coop sits down and for once doesn't end a sentence with some smart-ass remark. We're all worried. This guy has us all by the balls. And it's not sitting well with any of us. You need to get home today. Let us worry about the shit we can do here. Maddox pushes off the wall after giving me my marching orders and slams the newly replaced door against the wall in his haste to leave the room. Greg leans forward from the seat in front of my desk, resting his elbows on his knees. He's right. We'll handle shit here, and if anything new comes up, we'll call. Just go make sure she's okay. If you decide to come in tomorrow, then she comes with you. You didn't really think I was going to stay here today. Fuck you very much, Greg. All I had planned was filling you assholes in before I went home to my woman. I start packing up my laptop and anything else I think I'll need should I decide to start working out of my house until this shit is over. There's only ten more days in the month, so regardless of what we figure out, there's only a short amount of time before the deadline we're working against runs out. Greg goes to open his mouth, but I stop him as I round the desk to leave. Don't, okay? I get where you're coming from, and that's fine. But don't mistake my making sure you all knew what is going on as me not putting her first. Everything I do is to make sure that her happiness and well-being come before anything else. Got it. I leave him still sitting in front of my desk and head out to the truck. I offer Sway a quick wave as I walk down the golden, glitter-filled sidewalk and pass by the salon. He smiles and waves in his usual flamboyant way, and as per normal with him, there is no way you can't smile back. One thing with Sway, when things are starting to press in around you and your mood is as close to shit as it can get, Sway always makes the world a little bit brighter. I throw my bags in the passenger seat and peel out of the lot, heading home to D as quickly as I can. D throws the garage door open the second my truck shuts off. When I see her standing in the doorway with a small smile on her face, I let out the breath that I have been holding the whole drive home. I knew from her phone call that she is holding it together better than I would have imagined, but I've worried that with the time it took me to get home, she might have started to freak out. Seeing her now, and seeing that she really is fine, helps me untangle a little of the knot that settled in my gut. Hey, you, she whispers when I walk up the two steps leading into the house. She brings her arms up and wraps them around my neck, hugging me tightly. Hey, you back. Are you okay? She pulls back and nods. I'm fine, just worried about Chelsea, but I'm okay. She's a smart girl. What time did she say she'd get here? When she lets go of my neck and takes my bag from me, my body instantly misses the contact. I follow her through the mudroom and into the kitchen. She sets the bag down and grabs me a beer from the fridge. As I sit down at the table, I reach over and pull her into my lap. I don't want her more than a foot away from me right now. Not until I can calm myself down a little more. She's going to leave soon. I talked to her about fifteen minutes ago, and she had just finished loading the car. It's going to take her anywhere from six to eight hours to get here, so I would guess sometime in the middle of the night. She's got directions to the house. She knows to call at any time, and we'll be waiting for her. How is she holding together? I'm a little worried about her making that drive by herself, but I know she's much safer here than she'll be up there where no one can protect her. I think she's okay. I mean, as okay as she can be when a death threat basically just landed in her lap. 
What are we going to do, Beck? Unless we find Adam and have him shed a little light on this, I don't see what else can be done. I study her for a second while I take another pull from the beer. She really does seem completely fine. Maybe a little rattled, but that's to be expected. There isn't any darkness in her eyes that makes me think she could be having a setback. Nope, my wildcat is front and center, ready to fight for it. Let's try and focus on the positive here, okay? You're safe, Chelsea is safe, and there's no way in hell some sick fuck is getting close to either of you. When Chelsea gets here, we can take a look at things and see just what he said to her. For now, let me enjoy your sweet ass in my lap. She smacks my arm playfully and smiles. Pig? She laughs, and I savor every second of it. Beck, Beck, wake up. When Dee's soft breath and low whispers wake me from one of the hottest dreams ever, I immediately reach over and pull her closer. Her naked body rubbing against mine further ignites the desire burning inside of me. Beck, we can't start anything right now. Her laugh shoots straight through me, and my already painfully hard dick throbs. Her small hands pressing against my chest make my skin burn. She doesn't protest much when I start kissing down her neck. God, you taste good. I continue to kiss along her collarbone, ignoring her protest. The only thing I can think of is pushing inside of her welcoming body. My dick is begging for the release that only her body can provide. So damn good. I murmur against her breast before pulling one erect nipple in my mouth, twirling my tongue around the tip and sucking gently. Beck, please, I won't be able to stop you soon, and Chelsea just called. Damn, that feels so good. She stops talking and pushes her hand into my hair, holding me to her breast. Right when I'm about to push deep between her legs, her words finally make sense. I drop my forehead to her chest and try to hold myself back. How long? God, it hurts to stop. I'm close to begging her to just touch me. All it's going to take is a few strokes of her soft hand for me to explode. But I want to be with her. In her. What? Her eyes are clouded with desire, and I know that if either one of us is going to be strong enough to stop before we get any further, then it's going to have to be me. How long until Chelsea is here? Please tell me she isn't about to knock on the damn door. I can't even lift my head off her chest. Her pussy is hugging my dick, and as much as I would love to pull back and press into her, I know if Chelsea is close, this is the last thing I need to be doing. Relax, honey. She's a good thirty minutes out. Before I can even move, she wraps her hand around me, lifts her hips so that I'll move off her, and the second she has enough space between our bodies, lines me up. In a move that would make a porn star proud, she pushes off with her feet and buries my cock deep. She doesn't even give me a chance to move at first. She just continues to work her body against mine. If you want to do all the work, all you have to do is say something. I can see my wildcat itching to come out and play. She doesn't speak, just keeps pushing herself off the mattress. Her walls constrict and hug my dick tight when I speak. You like working my dick, D? You like the way it feels when you take what you need? She moans, and I can feel her growing even wetter. I let the strength in my arms and thighs slacken and press her deep into the bed. I asked you a question. Do you like working my dick? When she realizes that I won't let her move, she finally looks up at me. Her eyes are so thick with ecstasy that the normal light brown color looks almost black. She blinks a few times before a wicked smile forms across her beautiful flushed face. She runs her hands up my chest and wraps them around my neck before pulling me in close until we're nose to nose. I like it almost as much as when you throw my legs over your shoulders and pound my body so hard I'm sure I could feel you in my throat. Jesus Christ. My woman knows just what to say to get what she wants, and right now I can tell that she is begging me to take her hard. Is that what you want? You want me to take these long legs and wrap them around my neck like a goddamn bow? Be sure, wildcat, because right now I need you like you wouldn't believe. I lean back, holding onto her slim hips so that we don't lose our connection, and take a second to enjoy the view. She's already palming her tits, caressing and pinching her puckered nipples. Her body is raised slightly from my hold on her hips. 
She is completely at my mercy now, and when I thrust forward shallowly, I know she is only seconds away from begging for it. Her legs wrap around me and her heels try to dig into my ass to push me further. Answer me. I give her another shallow thrust, and when her walls clamp down and a surge of wetness coats my dick, I almost forget everything except taking what we both want. Now. Her eyes snap open at my hard command and burn into me. Yes, fucking take me back, take me hard. She doesn't even get the whole sentence out before I throw her long legs over my shoulders, rise up on my knees, and pull her body off the mattress with my hands on her hips. Her arms fall from her tits and help support her body. I've taken her in this position before, with all of her weight bracing on her upper back and shoulders, but never as hard as I'm planning. You good? I ground out, flexing my fingers against the soft skin at her hips. If you don't move soon, I'm going to hurt you. She pants and squeezes her legs around my head. Please? With one swift and powerful thrust, I finally let myself take her. My balls slap against her ass with each slam home, and it doesn't take long before her screams are echoing through my room. She looks so damn beautiful, legs around my neck, perfect tan body flushed with desire from welcoming each rough pump of my hips, and her eyes showering me with every single ounce of love I've ever craved from her. Complete 100% acceptance of everything I've ever dreamed of giving her. Stopping briefly, I set her body back down on the mattress, lower her legs from my neck, and slowly glide in and out of her wet heat. Her eyes flash when she realizes I've changed course, but when I press my thumb against her swollen clit, her eyes roll back in her head. I bring our hips together tightly and continue to strum my thumb against her. Right when I feel her about to fall over the crest, I pull back. Her eyes burn with frustration and I laugh. Does my wild cat want to play? God, I hope so, because the way her body feels when I'm balls deep inside her wet heat is almost too good. Stop playing games and fuck me. I shouldn't have laughed, because the second I smile and bark out a laugh, she takes advantage. Her legs push in and her hands shove against my chest. Somehow I manage to grab her hips and keep us connected as we roll. Her hands shoot out to gain purchase. One hand wraps around the headboard, and the other flies out, crashing against the nightstand. She doesn't even pause when the sounds of glass breaking and wood smashing against the floor mixes with our moans. She rides me hard and fast. Her strong legs push, and she grinds down against my rigid dick. I help lift her up when I can tell she's close, digging my feet into the bed to match each movement with a thrust of my hips. You feel so good, so good. Love how you love me. I groan when her words wrap around me and squeeze her hips tight. I'm close, baby. And just like that, she drops down, throws her head back, and screams my name. I have just a few seconds to enjoy the view before I flip our bodies once again and take what my body is craving. There is nothing better than feeling her come against my dick, her wetness so slick that even my balls are coated, and with each thrust her body holds me so tight that I feel like it's begging me never to leave. Yeah, when my woman is coming hard against my dick, there isn't anything better. Oh my God, Beck, I'm going to come again. Harder, please, baby, harder. Her legs wrap around my hips and her fingers dig into my back. The bite of pain from her nails breaking the skin is all the fuel I need. Fire dances down my spine and wraps around my balls. I take one more thrust into her body before I empty every last drop of myself into her. I don't know how long we stay like that, with my body blanketing hers and my dick making slow, lazy glides into her drenched pussy. When I fall from her body, the moans that leave both of us are borderline desperate. Leaning up, I look down at her. Her hair is in messy waves around her head. Her eyes are closed, and her face is flushed. The only clue I have that she's even awake is the small smile playing against her swollen lips. I press my lips against her and smile back at her when her eyes open. I think we should think about leaving this bed before I can't stop myself from taking you again. She smiles and nods. 
Come on, if we hurry, we can wash off before Chelsea gets here. Probably won't be a good idea to answer the door with you running down my leg. She laughs as she climbs from the bed and starts walking towards the bathroom. When she notices I'm not behind her, she stops and turns to look where I'm still sprawled out on the bed. My once slack dick is rock hard and ready for more. Fuck me, but just the thought of my cum inside her running down her leg makes every possessive part of me roar to life. Pushing off the bed, I stalk towards her. She looks confused for a second until I grab her body and walk towards the bathroom. Her legs wrap around my hips out of instinct. Chelsea's going to have to get over it. Just the thought of your body with my cum all over you is the hottest fucking thing you could have just said. Fuck, D. You make me want to come all over your body so everyone knows you're mine. That sounds kind of messy, honey. She laughs, pulling back to see how serious I am, which causes her laughter to die on her lips. You can't be serious? Not even bothering to answer, I busy myself with turning on the water and walking into the shower, rotating so that the water hits my back until it can warm. Oh, Dee, now that you're mine, there isn't much of anything I wouldn't do to make sure the world knows that you are taken. She doesn't protest much when I push her against the shower and take her body again. Her bright eyes and naughty smile are all the confirmation I need that she understands what I'm saying.